Paul Mensa's Wall of Power TV is brought to you in part by Two Gingers Irish Whiskey, Gray Wolf Lodge, your home away from home in the North Woods, and the Solar Arts Building in Northeast Minneapolis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metzen. Tonight we are going to be celebrating the life and legacy of one of Minneapolis's greatest musicians, Mr. Willie Murphy, who passed away on January 13th. Murphy was really the heart and soul of the Minneapolis music scene for over 50 years. He was a musician who could play from folk to funk. He was a bassist, a guitarist, a piano player, a songwriter, arranger, producer, band leader, vocalist, recording artist, and a philosopher king. His record, Run and Jump and Stand and Still, that he recorded with Spider John Kerner, was released in 1969 on Electra Records and brought John and Willie some more national acclaim. One publication called it a rag psychedelic ragtime record. Willie went on to produce Bonnie Raitt's first record for Warner Brothers in 1971, about a year after he started the legendary Minneapolis R&B band, Willie and the Bumblebees. We have two gentlemen, two of the best musicians in town, I'm honored to say, are both friends of mine <clears throat> that go way back with Mr. Willie Murphy. The first we're gonna chat with is my friend Willie Walker. The most nominated man in the history of the Blues Foundation <laughs> Blues Awards. He's up for Soul Blues Singer in 2019. Those awards are in Memphis and May. If you want to make a fun trip to a great show, he's been playing with Willie since the six, early to mid 60s. Maurice J. Cox, saxophone player for Willie and the Bumblebees, has been with Willie since the late 60s. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for showing up today and uh, sharing stories of the great Willie Murphy. Good to see you, Maurice. Good I know it's here. a little early for you. Good to be here, Paul. Willie, it's early for you, too. Hey, it's, it's early, but it's an honor to talk about an icon. When did you first meet Willie Murphy, Willie Walker? Oh, wow. I'm, I met Willie Murphy in, in 59. Really? Yes, late 59. Um, he was a bass player during, during those years. And through... A mutual friend. Uh, we we were putting together a group, and it was called the Valdines. And uh, in that group, there was Willie Murphy, Bill Lorden, James Smith. Bill Lorden went on to play with Sly and the Family Stone. Yes, Snow. yes. Wow. And we did a lot of jobs in synagogues. For, I mean, because we had Shapiro booking for us, because okay. it, it, it was a close relationship in North Minneapolis with Shapiro and East and, you know. Right. And he kept us pretty busy. As a matter of fact, I made more money then than I am now. <laughs> 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 you know, it's amazing, because, I mean, the synagogue jobs pay, paid very well. Wow. And I was happy just doing that. Right. But, um, I mean, we, we... And there was a big Jewish population in North Huge, yes, huge. Yeah. Yes. So what, uh, when you first heard Willie Murphy play bass, what were, your, what were your thoughts? My thoughts were he was phenomenal. And I was, I was blown away and even disappointed when I, when, when I heard he started playing guitar. Hmm. And then later it's like, now, now he's playing keyboards. <laughs> and then it's like, now he's singing. <laughs> there you go. All right, you know. And, a gifted, gifted, gifted young man. I remember hearing Willie and the Bees, and we'll talk about the Union Bar no. in the late 70s and 80s, but... I gotta I got straighten you out on that. Yeah. You never heard Willie and the Bees. Good you question. Heard, you heard Willie and the Bumblebees. The original Willie and the Bees was with me and Willie. Interesting. <laughs> Because over the years, after you left the band, everybody thought Willie and the Bees, that that was Willie Murphy, which it was, but the original Willie and the Bumblebees was... Willie and, yep, Willie and the B Bees, which, that was us, and, and the then, Bumblebees. Yeah, and then you became... 
Wee Willie Walker right. in the uh, mid to late 60s when you were recording uh, down in Memphis, yes. correct? So let's get back. Uh, we could do another two or three shows just so you know what we're going to. Um, but what I was going to say about the Union Bar, because I moved to town in 1978 when the bees would hold forth, geez, a couple nights a month anyway, and then over at the booth. Yep. It was the biggest dance thing in town, man. You want to go throw down and dance, you went to hear Willie and the Bees. But what propelled that band in my ears was Willie Murphy's bass plan. He was yeah. so oh, yeah. good. Definitely. Maurice Jaycox, when did you meet uh, Willie Murphy? We met in high school. Really? And we both went to Central High School along with a few other great musicians, Bobby Lyle and yeah. some other people. We all went to Central High School in South Minneapolis. And I was going to West High School um, after, I think in my senior year, and there was a dance, and Murphy's a couple of years older. I went to West High School and saw Murphy in the band playing at a dance. And went, God, that sucker's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but God, can he play. Right. And it was a great band, and also, uh, this was a, at a time that there weren't any integrated bands. Right. And in fact, no band with a black member even could play in downtown Minneapolis anywhere. Gee, I'd forgotten about those that's days. That's right, that's wow. right. <laughs> and so just seeing a black, I mean, seeing a white bass player in a black band, it was like, oh, okay. I mean, jazz it was different, but for, uh, music in the clubs, no black people. Mm. And so that was, a, that was my first taste of hearing him play, and he was very good. Yeah, we didn't like each other much then. <laughs> 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 he didn't think much of me, and I thought he was a little bit inflated in his ego. Well, Willie always had, uh, uh, he always spoke his mind, right? Willie, so how long did you play with uh, Murphy starting in 1959? Oh, we played together for a couple of years. Okay. And, uh, and then, well, he was pretty much straight laced. I mean, he, just a beer drinker, mm -hmm. you know, but I mean, a very, very hard worker. Yeah. And then with, when it came to the music, and it was a couple of the other guys that really rubbed me the wrong way with, the, with their actions on stage and, and, and in front of an audience. I mean, it, uh, I don't even know if I don't dare call names, you know? Right. But, because, you but, uh, let's why just not? say musicians that, that why not? Re remain homeless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, One's dead and, and uh, the others. Anyway, I mean, one of our biggest jobs that we were playing was at the Walker Arts Center. And uh, we had a beautiful crowd. And uh, while we were performing, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm missing guitar parts and I, I'm, Somebody will know who, exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking around, it's like, where's the guitar? And the guitar was playing to the paintings on the wall. <laughs> I, 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 was, I, was like, I was like, whoa, that's it, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, Willie Walker, when did you hook up back with uh, Willie and the Bumblebees? You know what? We tried it, I and mean, it, it, it just was not a comfortable scene for me at that time. And what year would have that have been? Uh, like about 63, 64. Okay. So, did you play with him in the late 60s, early 70s? No. Or? Okay. No. So when did Willie and the Bees right. actually start? When was the first gig, Maurice J. 1970. Okay. Um, Murphy had, we were all living on the West Bank, and Murphy had told me that he wanted to start an R&B band with horns and asked if I'd be interested. And we had worked on some other projects, most notably um, a Bruce Rubenstein movie that we did the soundtrack for. Well, and do you remember we, the name? Oh, gosh. Uh, no, I can think of it, but um, we did the soundtrack for the movie and 
1970, Murphy mentioned wanting to put together a band. I was going to take off for a vacation to California. And he said he'd hold a spot for me. So when I got back, he said, you know, you want to be in the band? I said, sure. And that was all well and good. But back then I played flute. That's all I played. And he said, man, we need, to, uh, we actually need a baritone sax player, not a flute player. And I didn't even own a baritone sax. I had never even played one. And we got one loaned to us and we rehearsed uh, as much as we could. And five days later, I was on stage playing baritone wow. sax. Wow. So <laughs> that was... Well, you're quite a musician yourself, Mr. I, Jacob. I had to, <laughs> no, I would just stumble my way through <laughs> it. Do you remember what the first uh, Willie and the Bees gig was? Oh, gosh. Probably someplace like the People Center, you know, it's one of those places. Well, you know, back in um, the late '60s, early '70s, Willie and the Bees was really considered. It sounds anachronistic right now. Considered the People's Band. Oh, we were. They called us Willie and the Benefits for a while. <laughs> <laughs> We'd do so many benefits that <laughs> we'd do more benefits than we did these for that. money. <laughs> really in the benefits. And we, there was a place on the West Bank called Dania Hall. Oh, sure. And upstairs on the third floor, they had an auditorium. One of the worst loads in the world, man. Did you ever play at the theater next door to the 400? Uh, actually, the no, this, no, that was, the, it was the, the cedar. There was a theater right next door. It to was the, the cedar. Right next door to, to yeah. The cedar. But there was a cedar. It was the cedar. Home. Wow. Sure. <laughs> that area has changed so much. You that know. was the cedar <laughs> theater, and it actually was a theater then. Wow. Yeah. We are going to uh, have my great guests, Mr. Willie Walker, Mr. Maurice J. Cox, on for the whole show tonight on Wall of Power TV. More conversation and memories of the late, great Willie Murphy. Uh, this year's blues recording is the next category. The winner is Willie and the Bumblebees. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the award. Willie and the Bumblebees 2009 blues recording, Honey from the Bee. I want to point out that, that um, there is some blues on this record, but mostly it's a slightly more, if you will, evolved style of blues, somewhat sometimes known as R&B, rhythm and blues, soul, funk. This is all one music to me, okay? And so, and hillbilly music is part of that too, as Maurice once said to me years ago, when I was talking about all the people I loved that influenced me, he said, well, Elvis influenced you too, didn't he? I said, yeah, well, yes, he did. And he influenced Maurice too. So anyway, it's, what, 35 years ago, I think we made this, and uh, I could talk, I could tell a lot of stories about uh, Dave Ray's recording studio up in the woods where we had an awful lot of fun. There was a lot of booze. Dave would have a big highball in his hand by 11 every morning because he was the kind of guy that got up in the morning. You know. we, we didn't start drinking till 2 when we got up. You know. We had a lot of fun doing it. I was just reminded of uh, one of the songs, uh, Misery, which is a blues in 3-4 time. And I had lost my voice and was told by the doctors I couldn't speak for three months, which I did. And that was, it's a great experience, actually. But um, the first thing I did was sing the vocal on Misery when, I could, when he said I could talk. I saved my voice on the trip up there and didn't open it until I sang the first words. We did it in one take, I'm sure, like we did many things. This is Jerome Broughton, who played guitar and bass, alternating with me. Gene Hoffman, tenor sax player and composer. 
Howard Merriweather, who played drums with us for 15 years and has the sweetest voice you ever heard to this day. And he does come to our jam session and sing once in a while. And of course, Maurice J. Cox, whose career has blossomed. Uh, who sang and played baritone, uh, alto, sax, and flute, and did other things like wear roller skates on stage and fall down. <laughs> But he, and very good, Maurice was always there for me when we would be in some little town with some really square crowd and they would say, which one's Willie? And I'd, and I'd point to Maurice, you know. <laughs> and last but not least, John Beach, who was our piano player and who wrote many of our best songs. Uh, and we wrote a lot of them together. And I want to remember Foyle Carter Harris, who passed away not too long ago, who was our trumpet player, who was a unique individual from Memphis, Tennessee, played with us for many years, and was a source of much merriment. Welcome back to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metzer. We were talking about and uh, celebrating the life and legacy of Willie Murphy, one of the greatest musicians to ever come out of Minneapolis. Really the heart and soul of Minneapolis for over the last 50 years. Joining me, two old compadres of Mr. Murphy, Willie Walker and Maurice Jaycox. When we ended uh, the last segment, Maurice, we were talking about all the benefits that the bees used to play. So back then, 1970-71, the Vietnam War was still going on, Nixon was still in office, and you guys were really not only the counterculture, but kind of as a band, kind of one of the focal points of the counterculture on the West Bank of Minneapolis. <sighs> that was a combination of raw talent and alcohol. Right. <laughs> I didn't mean, know other way to say it. Everybody in the band was talented, and everybody in the band uh, had their own abuses. Right. And we lived that lifestyle, unfortunately, for too many years. Uh, well, no when you see a couple of pictures, the old pictures of the band, like by the bus and things, oh, yeah. you guys look like something out of a Sam Peckinpah movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that was kind of us. Doug Ackerman, who flew, I knew Doug, what a sweet cat. flew around with the stones, yeah. and had gold records on his wall, and uh, through Doug we made a challenge to the stones. Um, a drinking bout, a pool tournament, or a bar fight. Whichever one they thought they could handle best. <laughs> and Doug gets back to us, he went over to London and he was hanging out with the Stones and he gets back to us and said, I made the offer to them. They looked you up and politely declined all three. <laughs> <laughs> this is when the Stones were rowdy. Yeah, right. They looked us up and mm, they politely declined all three. They just didn't have the cojones to face so Willie and we the lived that, We lived that life, but we also made an amazing amount of music. And uh, Murphy, for my money, probably is, well, he was one of the greatest living songwriters in America. Yeah. And definitely the greatest songwriter I've ever been around. And not only did he, in spite of his, and he would be the first to admit, and you just shared, in spite of the drinking and the drugging, he was still working, Absolutely writing, brilliant. arranging. And, and driven. And driven. 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 Driven to work. Tell us about Bonnie Raitt and how that all came around and how Willie Murphy ended up producing her first record in 71 for Warner Brothers Records. Um, Bonnie was out on the folk circuit out east uh, with, with uh, John Kerner and Dave Ray. And when she got her contract from Warner Brothers, which was, by the way, I think only $40,000, Nowadays, that's about the cost of one song on an album. Right, right, you know, right, right. But um, she had the contract for $40,000 to do a blues album, and she 
asked Dave Ray and John Kerner what they thought, and they both said, well, there's a band back in Minneapolis you really ought to check out, and you might want them to play on your album. Mm. And so Bonnie flew out here, and we spent about a week um, drinking in bars on the West Bank. And the old triangle, at right? At the triangle, <laughs> at, the <laughs> 400, right at the 400, and playing, playing pinball, and <laughs> talking a lot, and... Uh, but I just decided there, okay, this is the band I want to work. But it was originally gonna just, just going to be the rhythm section. And Murphy and I had already come up with some horn lines. And Bonnie didn't want horns. She just wanted four pieces. Mm -hmm. And so we both said, well, why don't you just, just listen, just listen. And... Um, and these were head arrangements. These weren't written down. You would just oh, kind of... Oh, most of the stuff would be written on scraps of things, but yeah. he'd tell you what he wanted you to play. And Sing it to you, your whistle. Up to you. to you to make a chart. Right. You know, we'd play it on bass or play it on piano or guitar and up to you to make the chart. And so um, we had the horn part and Bonnie rented a summer camp, a defunct summer camp on Lake Minnetonka out on the Enchanted Island. I love, the, I love that. I love that on Enchanted, Enchanted Island. Island. Rented it for three weeks, so we go out there, and Dave Ray is already set up, and he's got the studio in the garage, and the control room is upstairs, and so we go out, and Bonnie's still mm, about horns, and the first song we played on was "Finest Loving Man," and there's no horns on it until the end. And as as it vamps out, the horns bowed up, bam, bowed up, bam, and we did this thing in harmony. And Bonnie says, "Ah, ah, ah, the horns, the horns. We're gonna have the horns. <laughs> Gotta have the horns. <laughs> Gotta have the horns. <laughs> Gotta have the horns." And that's how it all happened. Was Freeball her bass player? Yes. As part of that. Yes. And her <clears throat> younger brother Steve. Yes. Who got to be? We got to know. A uh, very good friend of mine and a great singer. That whole family had sang oh, from yeah. John, from John Ray, the Broadway star. Big John, Big, Big John, John was amazing. We got to hang out with Big John. Oh, a few times. we got to talk about he was that. He's a pretty amazing guy. So, <clears throat> the whole record took uh, three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. And they did the Kerner tune, uh, "I'm Blue." Yep, "I Am Blue." And a lot of people now, in retrospect, consider that to be Bonnie's. Favorite, or their, that's their favorite record America? Oh yeah. Bonnie's. Oh, yeah. And we did a lot of things that hadn't been done. The whole record was done in four tracks. Wow. Um, a crown four-track machine. And the machine was upstairs in the garage. And any time anything, mistakes were made or to set a mic, Dave had to run downstairs and set it and then run. He must have run 20 miles, for sure, up and down those stairs in three weeks. But we got sounds, that, and in four track, if your viewers don't know, in four tracks, if there's any mistake, you've got to record it again. You, right. you don't just punch in anywhere, it's just, okay, take 32. Right. And, you know, right. and in our own album, I think we had one that went, take 65. <laughs> <sighs> so here we are, and we're doing um, I Ain't Blue, and we didn't want drums, and we were trying to, we wanted some kind of percussion, and we didn't want drums. Oh, there was one, one bit of percussion was just going with hands, and then, we kept getting sounds we didn't like, and the sound we finally liked, and is on the record, is the shuttlecock from Batten Mitten <laughs> go swishing around in a plastic beer cup, <laughs> a 16 ounce <laughs> beer cup. <laughs> and that, that and the little clapping of hand is the only percussion on that. Wow, record. that is, uh not only, that's so old school, it's primitive. And I played flute on it, uh, and at the end, there was about, oh, about a, a minute solo of flute with background vocals, which Warner Brothers cut out. Wow. 
We're going to be uh, back with Willie Walker and Maurice Jaycox, two good friends, compatriots, and musical partners of Willie Murphy on Wall of Power TV. As I've often said, I built the 400 bar as far as music goes. <laughs> Before that, it had been really a community asset and a community bar and, you know, like great regulars all in the daytime, you know. The Triangle Bar became a big hot youth bar. I mean, it was jammed and I would play there. Me and Kerner were on the road, Spider John Kerner I was playing with. We were touring all over all the time, but whenever we'd come back to town, we'd play at the Triangle and we'd play solo. We'd alternate sets and in between, it was so crowded, we would start going across the street to the Viking to drink. And the Viking was a bunch of, you know, nine old Scandinavians as all of us in there. And soon other people started going to the Viking. Pretty soon the Viking was a throbbing hippie bar too. So me and Kernis went down the street to relax in between sets at the 400 bar. And pretty soon other people went to the four. This is really true. We were pioneers in that sense, you know. So soon the 400 was a throbbing youth-centered bar. The two old people that ran it, George and Ann, were wonderful. Uh, they had had it for years. And they didn't know what to think of all the young people all of a sudden, you know. But they were nice, and they put out, like they had done for years, put the potato salad and ham and buns out on Christmas, stuff like that. This guy named Ted May bought it. He was a lawyer. He was thinking about having music, so they had an old piano, and one night I played the piano. It was down on the floor by the pool table. I played and sank as a performance, kind of, you know. And it was great, you know, everybody loved it. Tony Glover, I think, played with me played the harmonic, we set up a little PA. So immediately Ted built a little stage up in the corner in the front of the bar. Back then the bar was only half as big as it is now, the 400. We got a piano, Ted wanted me to play there and I got this guy that I knew that did pianos to get us an old piano and he, I had him beef it up. So it was really tough, because I played really hard. And I got an old helping still piano pickup on it. And I would just crank it to the max. Got a pretty good PA. And, uh, you know, I'd pound my foot when I played, so it sounded like a, like a drum, you know. And I played there every Wednesday for a long time. It was jammed. As I've often said, I built the 400 bar as far as music goes. And uh, people would come in and sit in with me, you know, different people. People that played like washboard. <laughs> the only other place that had music was the Triangle. Now the guy who owned it died, the son sold it. They tried to make it a jazz club for well, it was just a number of different things, but it wasn't what it, it wasn't the Triangle anymore. Mm -hmm. So there was really only the 400 for music then, you know. The 400 was really a, I mean, it's hard to describe. I, I often tell people who weren't alive back then or weren't old enough to be active in those scenes that they really missed the best time, you know. You know, kids who weren't around in the 60s missed a period that was just unbelievable. You wouldn't believe what it was like. The drugs and parties and the music and everything, you know. And that was sort of what was happening there. It was, it was in the 70s then, 70s and 80s, you know. It was just a magical place and a magical time, you know.